Hey everybody, welcome to Small Group. Today we're gonna to be talking about how you can be happy through humility. So Sunday we started our brand new message series, How to Be Happy, and Jesus began to teach us in what most believe the greatest sermon ever called the Sermon on the Mount. It starts in Matthew 5, it goes to chapter 6 and chapter 7, an amazing sermon. King Jesus is now giving his manifesto. This is the doctrine of the kingdom of God, and he starts teaching us. And it's interesting to see that he begins to teach us on how to be happy. In fact, we call the first part of his sermon the Beatitudes, and the phrase the Beatitudes is referring to a state of being that is happy. And so we gather from this that at the outset of his sermon that Jesus really does want us to be happy. So in the introduction to this great sermon that Jesus gives called the Sermon on the Mount, he starts by giving us the Beatitudes. And there's eight Beatitudes and the phrase or the word Beatitudes simply means a state of happiness. So in the Beatitudes, Jesus introduces the theme of his entire sermon, really. And like any good communicator, at the outset, they'll tell you where they're going. And he is telling us that he wants us to be happy. The theme of Jesus' first recorded and great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, is happiness. That's the theme of this message. And we see that in these first verses because the Greek word for happiness or blessed or blissful is used nine times in just a short amount of verses. And the Greek word is makarios, which means happy or blissful, full of joy. And the idea that Jesus is communicating here is that we can have happiness and he wants us to be happy. And he's going to give us eight qualities in the Beatitudes that lead to the happy life that only Jesus can help us to live. It's really amazing that Jesus personifies each of these eight qualities or eight beatitudes that lead to genuine happiness. He embodies all of them, and as we pursue Jesus, then we can be happy because we'll start to act like him. So the type of happiness that Jesus is talking about in this passage is it's not a superficial feeling that's based on happenstances or circumstances. Uh, that would be volatile, but the type of happiness that he's talking about is an abiding joy that defies our circumstances or the happenings around us. So a biblical illustration of this would be the Apostle Paul. Think about him in prison as he's singing and worshiping, praising God, even though his circumstances are really bad. Even in prison, he wrote uh, many books of the Bible. Think of the book of Philippians. And in the book of Philippians, while Paul is in prison, he writes to the Philippians and he uses the word joy or some form of the word joy 16 times in this book. So the happiness that God wants us to have is not based on our circumstances and what's happening around us. It can be joy even in the middle of hard times. And we're going to see how Jesus is going to teach us to be happy in any situation that we find ourselves in. This theme of happiness that Jesus has in his first message is really appropriate because when you think about it, Jesus really does want us to be happy. In fact, in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I want you to live life to the full. He wants you to have life and he wants you to have life more abundantly. Live life to the full. That's what God wants. So this is how he starts his great message by talking about true happiness because he really wants you to find true happiness. In fact, verse 12 of Matthew chapter 5, he says, Rejoice and be glad. I'm glad we have a God that wants us to rejoice and be exceedingly glad. That's our God, and that's what he's teaching about in his first and great sermon. So let's just jump right into the first beatitude in Matthew chapter 5. I'll just start in verse 1. It says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. So that's why we call this the Sermon on the Mount, because Jesus went on a mountain to teach it. And when he sat down, just a little comment about that phrase, he sat down. That was a contemporary way of teaching back then. Jesus was relevant in this way of teaching. Uh, most rabbis sat down and people would gather around to listen to what they say. In our culture, a lot of people stand up like we do at church on Sunday. Jesus sat down because that's the way they did it back then. And when he had sat down, his disciples came to him 
And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, verse 3, here's the first beatitude. Blessed or happy, blissful are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if you would just insert the word humble instead of poor, this will help you to better understand beatitude number one, because Jesus is really going to teach us that the happy people are humble people. So the context for Jesus saying happy are the humble is this. Number one, the Jews that he was speaking to had spiritual pride. They thought they were good enough on their own. They felt like because they worked and did certain things for God that that earned them right standing with God. They also felt like because they were related to Father Abraham, they had the right ethnicity and they were automatically in God's family. This was a spiritual pride that Jesus was addressing. That's the context. Another part of the context of Jesus' teaching here is that the people were in a really painful situation. Not only spiritual pride, but social pain. Remember, this context was during the Roman occupation of Palestine. Uh, the Roman army controlled and ruled over really harshly the people of God in Israel. Unfortunately, they had extreme taxes that they had to pay and the people were in great poverty. So Jesus was teaching them that if you'll be humble and not have spiritual pride, and if you'll be humble, even though you're going through hard times, you can still be happy because happy are the humble. So I hope right here all of us will really focus in because Jesus is trying to tell us that we can be happy in any situation and he's gonna tell us how. He's gonna tell us that the highway to happiness begins with humility. So the type of humility that Jesus is referring to here is extreme humility. In fact, in verse three, Jesus could have used one of two Greek words. And the Greek word that he did use is the Greek word patohos. And this is the type of humility or being so poor in spirit that you are like a beggar. In fact, in Luke chapter 16, the same word is used to describe the beggar that died in Luke chapter 16. And so when we think about how poor we are in spirit and how we must be poor in spirit to be happy, then we need to think about being a beggar before God. Not a prideful person that thinks, oh, my good works will carry me and I'm good enough, but to be in the posture of a beggar before the King of Kings saying, hey, I need you in my life. This is the type of humility that God is talking about. Jesus used the word for a beggar, not the other word for humility or poverty, which means panace. That's the Greek word that he could have used, but he didn't. And that simply refers to a lesser form of poverty. And it really refers to a person that's just a normal worker, a laborer that didn't make much money, but he worked for what he got. He doesn't use that word. We are in extreme poverty when we stand before God. And in humility, we say, God, I can't work for my own salvation. I can't do it on my own. I can't bring my own happiness. I'm like a beggar. And the posture of a beggar is what I really want us to think about is like a beggar that goes up to someone needing money and he's so embarrassed he, he kind of looks away as he reaches for it. This is how we approach God and say, God, I need your righteousness. My righteousness is not good enough. And I want to be humble, God, because you're perfect, but I sure am not. So God, this is, the, uh, this is how we come to him. In, in extreme poverty, being poor in spirit, not poor on the outside, not a real beggar, but in our heart, it says the poor in spirit, poor within us, like uh, having a, a, a desire to be with God and just begging him saying, God, I need you in my life. I need you and I'm begging for your power and your forgiveness and your favor. So Jesus is basically saying, blessed are the beggars, happy, are the humble and we see this in the Bible carried throughout the scriptures like in James chapter 4 that God resists the proud but he lifts up the humble in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 2 he says it this way but this is the one to whom I will look he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word I love that God says you know what you come to me humbly and I'll lift you up but God really does hate pride he opposes pride and humility, being poor in spirit, is the opposite of pride. So digging in deep into the Bible, we actually get a contrast of pride and humility. And it's an extreme contrast between Satan and Jesus. Satan is prideful. Jesus is humble. 
In Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 12, we get a glimpse into the pride of Satan, uh, the devil. Verse 12 says, How are you fallen down from heaven, O day star, son of dawn, Lucifer? How, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. Verse 13, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. And notice the amount of times that Satan uses the word I. He says, I will ascend to heaven above the stars. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. And then he says in verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And then he gets the answer from God. And this is the answer. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the grave. You're a dead man, to the far reaches of the pit. It's amazing to me to see how prideful Satan is. And by the way, that's what got him kicked out of heaven. And so we see the pride of Satan. And now I want to show you the humility of Jesus, which you don't have to look far. But in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Notice this, despising the shame. He was willing to go through the death, even the death of the cross, and to be spat upon, and to go through that terrible torture on the cross, and how all the shame that he carried of the sins of the world. It says despising the shame. He hated it, but he did it, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We see Jesus' humility led to him being seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And now I just hope that you'll understand in your life how important it is to deal with pride and to be humble like Jesus. So humility is the opposite of pride and humility is a recognition of need. It's saying, God, you know what? I need your favor. I need your forgiveness. I'm not perfect and I want to be more like Jesus and as we come before God humbly he'll lift us up he'll answer your prayer request when you come humbly before the throne of grace you can find help in the time of trouble I really love how Jesus teaches us that if we are humble we can be happy now and we can actually be happy forever check out verse 3 where he tells us at the end of the verse he says for theirs is the kingdom of heaven he says that you'll be happy in heaven for all eternity. I love this fact that not only will you be happy now, have joy even in harsh circumstances, that one day you'll be happy forever. So here's the big question, are you humble? And one way to figure out if you're humble or not is uh, would the people in your home say that you're humble? And I wanna finish up this little segment by recapping from Sunday about humility in the home. And I wanna ask you a question first. Do you argue? Arguing is a sure sign of pride. And if you're always an argumentative person, you're getting in a spat constantly with your spouse, arguing with people, it may be that uh, humility is a trait that you need to work on. Do you argue? Do you have an attitude? An attitude is a sign of pride. When you roll your eyes, your body language, maybe comments that you make, the tone in your voice, do they carry an idea that you have an attitude? And then uh, do you have uh, actions, helpful actions in the home? If you have these type of actions that, you know, like I'm willing to do the dishes or I'll vacuum, I'll clean the toilet, I'll pick up after myself and I'll pick up after others, I'll do the laundry, I'll help with the kids bath time and bedtime. These are uh, sure signs that you are humble. So one final question about humility in the home is, uh, do you have a hard time apologizing? Uh, oftentimes there's two really hard words for us to say to people that are close to us is, I'm sorry. Just admitting and saying, hey, look, I apologize. And if you're struggling with that sometimes, if you uh, fail to be quick to say, I'm sorry, then that is a sign that you struggle with humility. And really the home, the reason I'm touching on the home and humility in the home is because that's the proving grounds for humility. That's where we need it the most. And so I hope you'll apply humility to your home life. That's it for today. Have fun talking in your group about humility and we'll see you right back here next week.